oh, it's just a panic attack. That's exactly what the paramedics told me when they arrived at our home in the middle of the night one evening. I had been on sick leave for burnout and all of a sudden, just I think two weeks into my sick leave, I woke up in the middle of the night and there was this feeling of terror, of panic, of just my chest going <laughs> in this intense just loss of control over my internal state. I woke up and I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to die. I, I something's, I'm having a heart attack or something's going on. And I went up and I was all dizzy and I told my fiance, like, I, I, I need help. We need, we need to call the ambulance. And uh, I just, I, I've heard of panic attack. I mean, I met a lot of people who had panic attacks. In fact, I've had people come up to me while I was ordained as a Buddhist monk many times while they had panic attacks. Yet when I had one myself, it took me some time to realize what was actually going on. I wanted to make a video about this because someone made a comment on one of my videos where they uh, were saying they had a panic attack and, and it's something that people are ashamed to talk about. It can be difficult and much of the stuff that's out there can be very useful, but actually hearing someone describe what it feels like to go through it. And then also since I've now overcome, I haven't had panic attack in, in ages, it could be helpful for people who either are going through this or know someone who has gone through this to understand what it's like and also to understand that there is hope and it's not something that's going to last forever even though it feels so when you're in it it does it does feel very real and i also wanted to discuss the main issue with having panic attacks what it is that is the problem is not actually having a panic attack that becomes the the problem there is something else that that you'll yeah they will touch on that that is actually the most common thing that people have issues with which is is not the panic attacks itself but it's something else and uh, it's something that you can work with and that can you can make easier for you. So that night when I, uh, and also I want to point out that I am not a, uh, a doctor, I'm not a psychiatrist, I don't work in any kind of medical field like that. Um, I simply have had a panic attack and a few panic attacks and I want to share my experience with it, how it came to be for me and how I experienced it and maybe that will help you recognize this in yourself or someone you know. So when I called the ambulance in the middle of the night, uh, I remember that there were, there were two, two paramedics. One of them, a younger guy, was very compassionate and very understanding. The old one was kind of, oh, pfft, uh, this is a false alarm. We, false alarm, we thought this was a heart attack or something, but it, it's just a panic attack. So we, yeah, we can just leave him and we need to go. We have more important stuff to do. But the younger guy was really nice to me. He, he sat down and he's like, okay, it's, you've had a panic attack and are you okay now? Do you feel? And they tested my EKG and... It passed very quickly for me since I meditated so much. It was easy for me to observe this feeling and not, if I hadn't had that experience that I did in meditation, I probably would have just freaked out and panicked completely, which does happen to some people. But it passed rather quickly and then the, uh, the paramedic told me that, that this is okay and you should probably go see a doctor afterwards and talk to them about this. Also, when I said that I had been on uh, sick leave for burnout, I think there was two weeks into my sick leave, then they say, yeah, this is obviously what's going on here. And, and there's nothing to be worried about, even though it does feel like you're going to die. He said, it's, it's perfectly fine. One of the things that's so difficult about panic attacks is that it feels like you are dying. And, and I think the main thing to take away from this is that you are not going to die. I mean, you will obviously die. Everyone dies, so that's okay. And that's something we should work on, like our fears towards dying. But that that's not going to happen from this well unless you have like heart problems they actually are but then you it's the, the panic attack doesn't kill you that's not the main issue here it feels like you are dying because you have this loss of control this tension very often for me i had i remember the chest was just contracted like this it was like someone was sitting on my chest and i couldn't get air and my nose kind of that like squeezed like this somehow and I couldn't get air into me and I felt this sense of just complete nausea chest pain and the, the loss of being able to breathe and it felt like though I was dying very real I, I am dying and there's no nothing I can do about it there's no control I can't do anything that's the symptom that doesn't necessarily mean that you are dying just because you feel that way 
And as I said before, I, I used to live as a Buddhist monk. And the funny thing was that there were quite a few people who actually came up to me with panic attacks while they were in panic attacks. I spoke to dozens of people who had gone through panic attacks and helped them with that. But I actually met quite a few people who were going through panic attacks. And, and it was interesting to see that they all had things in common. I, the first one was when I was on a plane from Sri Lanka back to Sweden. And there was this guy next to me who uh, just like sitting like this and like, really clammy. And he started talking to me and he said, okay, I, I need to give you m my phone. This, and he had an, a brand new iPhone. They were pretty new back then. Uh, now they would be ancient, but one of the first models. And you know, this is my code to my telephone. So, so you, you press in here and you look at this name here, you remember that name. If I die during this plane flight, you have to call this person. And it, I think it was his daughter, I can't actually remember, and tell them I love them and tell them everything's fine. And he told me something about some money. I can't remember what it was, but something. And I was thinking, okay, is he going to blow up the plane? Like, no, then they wouldn't need me to call them afterwards. Or <laughs> What's going on here? And it was very clear after all that he's, oh no, he's actually going through a panic attack. He had complete loss of control. He thought, very real, that he was going to die. And he had the same thing. He said, I can't breathe. My chest is so tight. I am not getting any air. And I'm, I'm panicking. But I, I was sitting next to him. I was just trying to talk calmly. And that's, I think that's one of the best things you can do is to be there for them and hold their hand and just help them through it. Because the person who's going through it is in a complete, state of terror of lack of control they believe they are dying and you telling them no you're not going to die it's going to be fine that doesn't really help them that just makes them pissed off very likely so instead just being there and having them talk and i i remember i asked him to uh tell me if he, he could uh could he hear anything like from the plane like what is it you're afraid of can you hear any any noises from the planes like what can you hear the sound of the air rushing and and i said can you feel that your seat can you feel what it feels like to sit in your seat can you smell anything in here and i, I got him back to his senses and, and that's actually one of the techniques i learned later that uh, people do to get people out of these states it's because you're so stuck in your mind in this distortion or tension that's going on inside of you that it's difficult to be aware that hey, you're actually here right now and being mindful is one of the things that you even prescribe for people with these kind of problems to help them overcome them so being aware of your senses and your surroundings is something that can really help and that guy on the plane i remember i talked to him and he he gradually calmed down i think for him it lasted quite a long time it was like an hour or two uh, at least for me, when I had it, it was like 10, 15 minutes. It was really intense and then it just kind of passed and I felt the after effect like I had been completely gone through some extreme marathon, something with brain squeeze and everything. So he, I, I helped him through that by, by talking to him that way and the phone kind of, uh, he kept on talking about this phone that was, for some reason, that was something he, he held on to. People can have that kind of experience as well. And I later learned that being in tight spaces is something that is common for a lot of people. That that they get panic attacks when they're in those kind of places. Now, I don't know what triggered it for this man. For me, it was an extreme lack of sleep that I had thanks to um, a hernial injury. An injury. I have um, herniated discs in my neck. They made it so that I couldn't sleep and I spent about three quarters of a year sleeping anywhere from three to five hours waking up with cramps heat flashes that was just crazy and just anxiety and not being able to function because of that and on top of that i had a lot of stress with things going on around around me my father passed away i had a new job i had a we had a new house and we were starting a family and there was just a lot of things that were going on at the same time. We had a miscarriage. There's just a lot of stress. But I, that in and of itself I could have handled, but that on top of that, then having the sleep deprivation just crashed me. So this man, I don't know what happened to him. I remember one other uh, young man who had a panic attack while I was with him and he, he um, uh, had it at the same time as he was going through a... Um, uh, what are you doing here? I think he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, if I remember correctly, and he had a, um, what do you call it, a psychosis. So he was going through a psychosis while I was with him and, and really had panic and fear. And he kind of was walking around and then uh, he said there is a vampires and he was afraid of war and people. And like, just his mind was just out of control. And then eventually while he was talking, it was we were trying to calm him down. 
he just kind of rolled up into a ball and just started shaking and just couldn't handle it. It was too much for him. And he also said, I can't get air. I'm dying. I'm dying. You have to help me. Like, uh, yeah, very real fear and loss of control. So when you see someone who's in these states, realize that it's, it's for them, it's real. Uh, we tend to do the thing that we ask, like, are you dying? Okay, are you having a heart attack? Do you have these symptoms here? Is there, you, you're not cut? No, you'll be fine. You're just imagining it. But for them, they're experiencing it as real. And that can be so scary and so incredibly... Yeah, one makes you to want to pull back and not talk to anyone. So having someone who's there with you can be incredibly helpful. I had my fiance afterwards that I could talk to and we could sit up and, and I didn't go through it alone, even though I had to experience all of it alone. I got into a little bit like what you can actually do to handle this situation or to make it better. And for me, I've had, I, I don't actually remember how many I've had, but like fully blown panic attacks, that's less than I can actually count on my hand. But I could always feel them coming on. And one of the things you can do, or you can also see in other people, if you know someone has had a panic attack and, and you start observing these things, you can be aware of when they are likely to start feeling this again. So for me, I couldn't, um, I had problems with music playing in the background. If I, I was listening to music, that was easier. But if I was having a conversation with you and there was this music playing in the background that just my mind could not handle it. It was too strong. It was just, I couldn't, my mind somehow couldn't separate between the conversation we were having and the music here in the background. And it just, too, too overwhelming. So having a lot of stimuli and people are sensitive to different things. For me, sound like that was very difficult. I had a hard time with um, heat. If it was warm and I got sweaty, like again, this claustrophobic kind of feeling. If, if, if I was feeling like I was too warm, I had a sweater on, I was often overheating, then I had to take that off because the heat would just be, I couldn't take it and I could feel this kind of like rising feeling coming ready to, to, to start overwhelming me. And the feeling that I got many times was that I would get a, um, I call it brain squeeze. So basically it feels like someone takes the actual brain matter and just squeezes it like this. Uh, very strange feeling. We're not talking headaches. It's more like the, the brain becomes a muscle and just cramps. Uh, and I, I can, I can force myself through this. And that's what I did. I think a lot in the beginning, I tried to go through it. Because before I actually got burned out, I, I was having these brain cramps kind of coming on, but I didn't understand it. And, and before, I think it was the, yeah, that's actually when I, I asked to be uh, put on sick leave for my burnout, was the week before I was walking and then all of a sudden, oh, I, I can barely walk. I, I could feel my whole head swooning and I couldn't keep my balance and my mind was, my, I was almost losing my vision. And the, the, this is one of the symptoms that I would feel when I was getting closer to having a panic attack, this, my brain squeezing. So it's, it's an overwhelming of the sense, senses. It can be hearing, in other words, trying to separate different sounds. The, the brain is kind of damaged, right? So the brain is not able to take in stimuli the way that a normal person can take in stimuli. You can't do after you've been in a burnout or, I mean, I'm talking of this from the perspective I have gone through, gone through a burnout and then getting a panic attack. But there are other things that can cause it also. There can be genetical things. You can have it from depressions or like there's a lot of things that can kind of lead to panic attacks. Drug abuse, absolutely. Um, so the overwhelming of my senses, usually the sound separating, couldn't handle it. If there's too many things happening at the same time, then I'm also getting this brain squeeze. If I'm in the kitchen in our house, I have one kid who's asking for me to uh, may cut some apples into we cut these apple boats. So one is screaming like apple, 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 one apple, apple. And then there's another one. Hey, Papa, can you give me the, the scissors over there? And then at the same time, I have the smell of the food I'm making and it's warm. There's like all these impressions. And uh, maybe my wife is asking for something as well, my fiance. And then all of those things, the brain just kind of starts having this cramp. And now, fortunately, my fiance is incredibly understanding. I am very fortunate that I'm with a partner who understands me so I can tell her I'm having a hard time. Can you take over? Even though she's tired, she always takes over and it always helps out. And that is an incredible help for me. I've also had it at my work. I have such good bosses I've had, the, the last two bosses I had 
who really understand and who want the best for me. So they understand when I say, oh, this is difficult, I, I couldn't handle conflicts or I couldn't handle difficult situations or I had, um, I, I could, this sounds strange, but if I had a time, I had to be a certain place at a certain time, incredibly stressful and it would make my brain kind of squeeze up because when I had to stress to get somewhere or stress when I had to be, just the idea of having to be somewhere, it's, it's so difficult to understand how the brain just can't handle the things it can normally do because a normal person can have these things, uh, a schedule at 10 o'clock I do this, 11 o'clock I do that, 12 o'clock I do this. I, I had to limit what I did. So I would have one thing in the morning and one thing in the afternoon, preferably just one thing during the day, not, not more than that, because that could be difficult for me to handle. There's a lot of these triggers that I, I just now kind of thinking about. They, I know them now, but they don't come up as often. So it, it's worth talking about also that, that it does get better, but also very likely if you've had a full-blown burnout that led to the panic attacks, you will never be the same, meaning you will never, your mind is not going to work the way it did before. Like the stimuli over stimulation that you can't handle it is something I I still deal with that. Uh, it's just that I'm good at understanding it. If um, Another example is if I'm driving a car and there, it starts to rain, especially if it's snowing, then when I was uh, really bad, then I couldn't handle, I couldn't drive while it was raining or at night and there was lights coming at, my brain just couldn't separate those things. And then I could feel the rising, like it's coming. It's like, it's really like something rising up and getting worse and worse and worse. And, and you can limit the stimuli. You can also limit, I think caffeine is one of the things that I noticed so clearly that if I drank uh, even tea that doesn't contain a lot of caffeine, if I drank tea uh, and that would like make me go like this, I drink some, something called um, yerba mate, which is a, a kind of like coffee, but from South America without many of the negative side effects. If I would drink that, I could immediately feel that I I was worse. I was more sensitive. Alcohol is the same thing. And it is very common for a lot of people to just stop drinking. They stop dating. They stop socializing so much because it's just overwhelming for them with all those uh, inputs. I should say that you should limit your stimuli, meaning like limits so you don't get overwhelmed. But also, I think it's important that you don't retract yourself from the world too much because... I was fortunate that I lived with someone who, who my partner, she's very understanding and she's really considerate and understands that it's okay to feel bad. It was very tough for her to be living with someone who was going through this at the same time as we just had a newborn child also after this. But not pulling back from the world too much because if I would have pulled back completely, if I wouldn't have had her, the chances are that I could have just locked myself in my house and ordered pizza and just kind of gone down, 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 down. And I lost contact with the outside world. So I, th I at least think it's important that one doesn't isolate oneself too much. And at the same time, you need to limit what you're doing, meaning that you probably shouldn't go out drinking and dancing at a pub. It's like drugs and stuff like that is just a big no no. And it's just so interesting to see that for most people, it just happens naturally. It's not like you have to tell them because they can just feel, okay, this is really bad for me. If I take this, I'm going to fall over the edge. So, learning about these things and understanding them and looking at yourself, what is it that triggers it for you? I have the things that I'm, I'm used to and I, I know them and I can kind of feel them. Uh, another interesting thing that's almost funny is that if I look for things, I just, even now, this really makes my head go like that and the crab's starting to come. If I go and look, and I, uh, where's the, my, my fiancé will ask, where's my telephone? And, and I need to find it. I go, need to go to work. If I start looking and really searching, I get this brain squeeze like almost immediately. I can't, somehow it's this focus of cramping and like need to find, or there's something about that. I just can't do it. So if I need to look for something, I have to be really relaxed and take it easy and and really just move around like this. I can't really go, okay, searching like this. My brain just squeezes and it doesn't work. I said before that the problem with having panic attacks is not actually the panic attack. That's not the main problem. And this might sound strange, but I've, I've had, as I said, probably five, six, maybe even more people who came up to me while they were having panic attacks. But then I've also spoken to dozens of people who have gone through panic attacks. And the thing that I saw that was in common for, I think, pretty much all of them 
was this one thing. It wasn't actually the panic attacks that are, what do you say, disabilitating or de debilitating that make them break down. The problem is there's a fear of having a panic attack. That is the main issue for most people, the fear that I will have a panic attack. And if you remember, the first time I had someone come up to me, it was on that plane when I was going back to Sweden. And the man had a panic attack on a plane. And this is very common because we have a fear. <gasps> I'm going to have a panic attack on the plane. Imagine that. If you feel I'm going to die, I have a loss of control. My body is just completely out of control. And you have terror, like real terror. Imagine being locked up in a steel cylinder flying, or aluminium cylinder flying 10,000 meters up in the air. That's, that's not going to help. So people thinking about, oh, I can't get on that plane. I, I, I can't fly. It's quite common for people who have had panic attacks. Like I have so much fear of getting on a plane because they fear that they're going to have a panic attack on the plane because they can't get off. There's this feeling when you have the panic attack that you just want to get away. You just want it to stop. And on a plane, that would be very difficult. Uh, I've had people say that they... Uh, one guy who was the owner of a company and when he was talking to his colleagues he felt like if he was having a meeting he was so afraid to stand in front of the people and talking because what if I have a panic attack while I'm giving a presentation on an important meeting and that fear would then build up and it would basically create a panic attack a low-level panic attack I don't think he ever had one during a meeting but this was so difficult for him because he needed to have these meetings and yet he had this fear all the time of oh my goodness what if I have a panic attack while I'm in a meeting so getting on planes, having a meeting, or uh, imagine if you're doing um, driving a car, driving a car. What if I have a panic attack in the middle of driving? I actually had that while I was driving. I started having panic attacks and I could feel. I had to just hold my hands like this and just drive. I was on the highway and I was starting to have a panic attack and I could really feel lose loss of control. And because it, it's so difficult, you can't do anything. It's, it's not like you have a panic attack, oh, it's difficult, and you can just keep on doing whatever you do. No, it's like you, you, everything is just breaking down. I didn't feel, I didn't understand how to drive the car anymore. So I had to drive and just turn off the road. And I think there's, in Sweden, we have these, you're not supposed to stop on them unless the car breaks down, like small uh, things where you can turn off. So I actually turned off one of those and just sat there and, and started breathing. So the problem for most people is not the panic attacks, it's the fear of having another panic attack. And if you have had a panic attack, it's really good to understand this, that most people don't have loads of panic attacks. As I said, fully blown panic attacks, I think it's less than five. I've had many small that started coming up towards becoming a panic attack, but then since I was aware of the signals, I do a lot of meditation, so it's easy for me to kind of calm down. But it never really, very rarely blew up into a fully blown panic attack. And for most people I talk to, it's not like they have panic attacks left and right every single weekend. It's more something that happens a few times. And then they have so much fear of it that they start pulling back and pulling back and start isolating themselves. And then they're afraid to do everything, going into social. What if I go to meet friends at a dinner party and I have a panic attack? What am I going to do then? What if I'm on the bus? What if I'm out walking and I can't lie down or it just makes it very difficult to do anything at all but this is also something we can work with if, if you understand this and you see okay you know what first of all i'm not going to die from the panic attack the panic attack in and of itself is a, a is it a parasympathetic response you call it or it's, it's your nervous system just kind of being overwhelmed and reacting like you're gonna die so yes, what was I saying? Realizing you're not going to die, but then looking at this feeling, because when you start feeling it, then you, you stop and you start getting back into your senses. And mindfulness is something that can be really useful. Uh, we got some, um, we have it here at the, we call them Vård Central. It's basically like a local center where you go to the first sta stage when you get sick. And I actually took a course in mindfulness, which was ironic since I lived as a Buddhist monk for six years and meditated like 10 hours per day, most of those years. And I went, Still, I wanted to go because I wanted to see, can she teach me something new? Is there something about this that I don't understand? And um, I was a bit disappointed at the help I got from that, but it was still interesting to see. And, and I have also met a lot of people who have had help from meditation and mindfulness because it helps you come back and see that it's just sensations happening in your body. And you can work with that. 
for some people, they really need to take drugs because it's, it just gets to the point where they can't function. And I think it's really important to point out that if you need help and there is no shame in this, ask for professional help, go to a doctor, go to ask for a counselor, a psychiatrist. And if you really need to take medicine, it's not like you're going to be on medicine the rest of your life. It's it's a period when it's at, at its worst. And then after that, very likely, a lot of people have panic attacks and then they kind of go away. Well, at least I'm thinking of a few people right now who had it that way. They had panic attacks. It was really hard for a period and then those went away. But then they had the fear of a panic attack for many, many years before they were able to get over that. So don't let it go that far. You can ask for help. You, you don't have to do this alone. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. I, for me, it was difficult because people say, oh, well, you were a Buddhist monk for six. How can you have a panic attack? Can a Buddhist monk, like ex-Buddhist monk, like what you must know, you probably don't understand meditation because if you did, then you wouldn't have panic attacks. And th there's all this stuff that comes with it. If you tell people there's this fear in the beginning, like I can't just tell them because what are they going to think of me? Are they going to think I'm nuts or that there's something wrong with me? But it is okay. And, and you're not alone. This is quite a common thing. There's a lot of uh, support groups. I was never in one, but I know of people who actually even created their own. I have my best friend from when I was younger uh, had real issues with this, and he started a support group by himself and just started have, inviting people over. It was not that he was the expert in panic attacks, but he said, I want to talk to other people and have people on my channel here who message me all the time and, and talk about these kind of things. I have some of my coaching students too, because it's nice to know that you're not alone. It's nice to know that this will get better. This is not going to be your life, the rest of your life. This is a period you're going through now and you can work through this if you need to, and you very likely do ask for help don't try to do it alone because it's i mean wh why if so what if someone thinks you're dumb because you have panic attack like that doesn't matter the most important thing is that you you are okay and that you can function and that you can enjoy life again and it took me this is f five years ago now that i had this almost five and a half and now five and a half years later i can say that i'm not worried about panic attacks anymore. I can still have the brain squeeze and I still have the the problems from it, but it was not really the, the panic attacks that created that. That was the burnout that created the, my mind is just not the same. And um, understanding that it gets better and that there are others who have gone through it and talking to them, just sharing it. And the reason I'm making this is because, as I said, one, one person left me a message in one of my videos now and, and just was going through the same thing. And I thought, oh, I haven't actually done a video of this and it's something I talk about quite a lot uh, and I care deeply about because I know how scary it is. I know how difficult it is to sit there alone and to have people come up to you and say like, oh, you don't need to panic. They're just like, it's just in your mind. Like you're just imagining this and they just don't understand that it, it's not just a small thing. It having a panic attack when we unfortunately use it sometimes like oh man there's so much i felt like i was having a panic attack people kind of throw those things around but if they actually had a panic attack then yeah, that's quite a different thing i also see people who have panic attacks get quite defensive about it. like oh you know what this if you have a panic attack you know you've had a panic attack and i have to say that's true if if you've had a panic attack you'll know you had a panic attack because it is a really really scary thing to go through and um meditating it's really good like to try to become more aware try mindfulness try becoming aware of your senses around you and you can get through this it's, it's not going to be like this the rest of your life there is hope there are millions of people who have done this before and just look on youtube you'll find so many videos of other people who've gone through this and ask for help in your environment uh, tell tell your friends about it if you feel shy then tell people you trust maybe you're worried because they're going to say something at work but understand that it's not worth losing your health just because you're like worried about what someone will think about you and then your friends if they really are your friends they will very likely understand and you might be surprised when you start talking about this i had when i start talking about it openly i had other people come to me it's like yes i went through that also or uh, especially the burnout part like people said i was so they were close and they could feel it coming but they could stop it and some people couldn't but they hadn't really talked about it so there's a lot of people going through this and just talking to other people makes it feel more 
or less scary, less as if though this is the end of the world because it can feel like my life is over. I can't work, function anymore because I'm so afraid of going out again. Ask for help and look for a mindfulness retreat or something. If if you want to understand more about meditation, I do live guided meditations on Mondays at eight o'clock uh, p.m. Central European time where we sit as a group. It's a very nice group. We just sit and we talk and uh, we have, I'll guide you through the meditation. And then afterwards there's questions and answers and people can ask anything they like. I also do it on Thursdays, but then it's more people meditate by themselves. Still have the questions and answers after. And I think it's a really good idea to join a group with other people and just meditate because it will help you become more aware of what you're going through. I should point out one thing that I've noticed in some people have panic attacks is that when we meditate, we often tell people to close your eyes. And I would have this during my um, retreats or when I had classes that some people would go, they just wouldn't close their eyes. And you can have so much fear and so much worry about getting a panic attack. You're just closing your eyes and sitting amongst other people can trigger that. And then even if someone tells you to meditate and close your eyes, then I recommend you to keep your eyes open. So join us on Mondays and Thursdays if you want to learn more about that. And I've said it so many times, but I'll say it again. Ask for help, professional help. Don't think you need to do this alone. There is hope and it will get better.